called that conflict that people had about the morality of slavery. Cognitive dissonance. That conflict about slavery. And what did they say? Slavery was doing what for people? Yeah, we're bringing civilization. The slaves actually love slavery. Oh yeah, I know. Sometimes you gotta give the back of your hand, but they love slavery. And What was the big export and the reason why the South thought they'd win the Civil War? Cotton. Cotton, they thought, would do it all. And what two states had the high, the really high percentage of slaves and be the first ones to secede? Did anyone say Missouri? Not Montana. No. Well, no, there's land here. I mean, it's, <laughs> it wasn't like the black hole. But yeah, I know, actually, during the war, though, I'll tell you a story about that when we get there. Okay, so let's go ahead then and we got to the positive. Good theory of slavery. Did we, I think we mentioned the culture of slavery, so let's go right to there. Did we do this? No, we were Am right I just making this? Yeah, oh, yeah, so we, we got the. Let me add one more thing about the positive good theory. The basic element about slavery, the basic element of you were know, civilizing them, and so it's a much superior system than in the North. An important thing to know about this positive good theory is that is going to become the ideology of the South. We have a natural system that is superior here. It is better than the system in the North. People know their place. And then there's one more thing. We're civilizing slaves. If you let the slaves go free, what are they going to do? In fact, they say it, he says it in the positive good theory. They have, where they have been where they got rid of the Asian relationship. I love how they say that. What a horrible thing. They have been invariably sunk into vice and pauperism. Okay, what's pauperism? What it is to be a pauper? In a way. But it means poor. You know, just impoverished. And so they're capable of... Uh, they're capable of doing anything on their own. So they become impoverished and they will starve. Or they'll turn to vice. And what's vice? Well, vice would be, yeah, cannibalism actually is considered a vice, but what else is it? What is vice in general? A vice. Do you know what vice is? <clears throat> Heck, there's a police department, parts of police, big police departments that it's the vice squad. Vice. Vice is a sin crime. It's a crime because people who make the law believe it is a sin. So, you know, we can see, like, I steal this. That's a crime because I stole it. Hmm? Thanks. And, and, and that means any, but advice is, we just, your action, we think it's a sin. So things such as, like, you know, drinking, you know, it could be drugs, prostitution, gambling, you know, things like that. That's vice. So we immediately assume that, okay, slave, you know, former slaves cannot control themselves and they'll immediately start sinning. Because they can't control themselves. So they got to be controlled, especially um, males. And this is going to be become, like, indoctrinated during slavery. Male slaves will immediately turn to horrific vice. And the same thing is going to be said then after the Civil War. And you know anything about incarceration rates today? There's no doubt that that attitude continues. I mean, this is not just something that people kind of make up about that blacks are arrested more. No, this was the attitude that goes back as a defense of slavery, which is pretty amazing how the tentacles just kind of continue to go on. 
to this very day. But anyways, that's a uh, anyway. So no big deal. That's not what I meant. So that's the positive good theory of slavery. And slavery is a good thing. Did they believe that? Maybe. <laughs> but what they believed is this gives us something to justify slavery. This is something we can rally behind. Even if we know it's garbage, we can say, but slaves like slavery. We're civilizing them. It gives them something. Yeah, maybe they believed it, maybe they didn't, and they didn't care. We're trying to find ways to justify it, even if we lie to our teeth. Teeth? Teeth. <laughs> so, let's talk a little bit about the culture of slavery, and this is the culture of the South. And it's going to be a very stratified system. And here is the slaves having fun with the banjo. Banjo, and it, an African instrument. And South is going to be very rural. There won't be industry. There won't be factories. And this rural lifestyle will become ingrained in Southern ideology. In the North, they have a small farmer. That's going to be their ingrained into the Great Depression. Here, the plantation home. This is actually one from before the Revolutionary War. Warm? War. Why am I doing that today? Well, the power went out. I had to recharge. And... This is another idyllic shot. I like this one because eh, just working, taking a little break. What was it called where slaves had to meet, meet a certain amount every? Oh, yeah, that, which is really increased productivity, but it's terrifying. I always got to have a steamboat. There's a lot of pictures from the south of the steamboat. This shows this idyllic version. But this is the matter house. Only a tiny percentage of whites actually had a significant number of slaves. This is actually pretty startling. Over three quarters of whites in slave states didn't have slaves. That's when the Civil War began. And the thing is, these are the ones who fought in the war. They're the ones who fought for the South. Not the one per, or 0.1 percent that had the vast majority of slaves. Most slaves were owned by a tiny little group of people here. In fact, over 50 percent of slaveholders had less than four slaves. And so we're talking a tiny little percentage. So it's mostly, this is just poor whites. And for a reason I'll tell you later on, but also because you know, we're an extraction for raw materials, hot in society in the South, there's no industry. There's not a lot of diversification. The only way one of these people can measure, have success, to become a successful, basically the only way, is if they get what? They move into this and get a slave. That became their measure for success. And you get the weird exactly. thing. Thank you very much. I'm waiting for this all day. <laughs> Think you bought that? <laughs> no, sometimes go back to Christmas. Okay, good. They hear it, yeah. The investigation begins into the power. <laughs> so with that, that's the only chance to get a slave. I mean, that's the only way they can show any, show they have any measure of success. I got the slave. You can have three slaves, so three blacks in the South. If they stayed there, how do they know they made it? They would get slaves too. I know it seems like a contradiction, but that was how you made it. In fact, that's one of the things they're worried about. If you take away Slavery, you take away the only avenue they have for success. Why do you think they fought so hard to keep it? Now, looking back, you can say, wait a minute, you can be lots of opportunities we open it up. Well, no, people don't necessarily see that. They look around what they see in their in their vision, and that's all they see. I can maybe get a manor house. So it's going to be really stratified. That reason will be the biggest why immigrants go to the north. Why would they go down here to compete with all days who don't have any path up except to get a slave? And for that matter, slaveholders will rent out their slaves for lower wages. They keep the money, of course, driving wages down even further. I'd rather go to Philadelphia and take my risk. Why Philadelphia? Why not? And so, let's go right to this. I like this old plantation all, and here are the slaves overjoyed and happy. There's the banjo. We're just having a blast, right? That would become the idyllic version of slaves. 
liked slavery, they enjoyed it, and after the Civil War, this is going to be a major myth. That the slaves enjoyed it, and the Civil War blew all that up and disrupted society. Now, people don't know where they're supposed to be, how they're supposed to act. I wish there was a steamboat in here. That's a shame. This is the reality. Tiny little homes. This is in Texas, slightly bigger, but that would be the norm. And you remember the positive good theory, the master and mistress provided this? Who built it? Yes. Yeah. And these tiny little hovels, 8 by 8, 10 by 10 feet, you'd have packed. They'd be packed with people, especially in the winter. Dirt floors, they're all going to be sick. Parasites would be spread amongst them. Over half did not live past age 1. Now, that was much different though, than the rest of society back then, but still. The food was horrific on these. Yes, they would make it. The master and mistress was not, hey, I'm cooking up for you while you're in the field. No. Usually a cornmeal. Cheap. What's the problem with cornmeal? Where you get your protein. Slaves looking back, they would talk about all, all of them. One overriding thing. Well, there were two overriding things, and one of them was hunger. Just constantly hunger. Constantly. This is feeling we're never eating enough. And you think about the quota system, they're working and working and working and not getting protein. Beans, peas, would that be a source of protein? Occasionally, you know, a little bit of salt pork or something like that. Here is one in Texas, and this is right after the Civil War. And I just like this picture for a lot of reasons, but I like how we gave the dog the seat. And know the dog. When I first looked at it, I thought, that dog is the skinniest dog I've ever seen. It's a black patch. Belly. Ada Marker, is that what? Yeah. And one overriding thing about slave life is this constant rat of tear. The quota system and all of that worked would tear the chance being beat for the most minor offense. And so here we have brands. And brands would be given, yeah, sometimes you just give a brand, but the big thing is that's a torture. You don't know your place, I'm going to let you know your place. You, I own you. These muzzles would begin for either talking back or some other infraction, and it's steel, I'm sorry, not steel, iron. Sometimes it'd be a leather strap, sometimes an iron, they would be iron. The ones I've seen were iron. So they would kind of latch them on the head and bolt them on the back. And it would weigh, you know, 15 pounds. You, you know, you ever picked up a piece of cast iron? Same thing with this around the neck. That's to keep it from running away. You can't run away when that's on your neck. And this would stick out a foot. How are you going to get away? By the way, you're wearing this, you still got to meet your quota. That's not going to change. Here are a couple more slave uh, torture devices. Chains, of course, were common. Here's another example of the mask. Those go around your ankles. These will go around your ankles, too. Those were iron, steel band, or an iron band that'd be bolted on your ankle. Now, technically, they think you might run away, so they put that on there. But it's a torture device. Now try to try to walk around with that. Think about it. 15 pounds on each leg. And yes, you still gotta meet your quota. That doesn't change. The whole thing about terror is, yeah, you gotta be the masters had to be willing to do it. But the idea being you do it to a few and everybody else will follow because they don't want that to happen to them. Doesn't make it any less horrific, but that's the idea of it. And it's got to be this ultimate, awful punishment. Now, of course, oh, that's branding. That's whipping. <coughs> whipping. This is a Union soldier. During the Civil War, when the United States retook New Orleans, this is in 1862, and you have all these slaves who are running away to join the United States Army and finally let them into the Army. They want to fight to prove they deserve citizenship and fight to free their families and friends. A, U a Union doctor took a picture of this volunteer, and that was his back. And he was whipped so many times. I mean, that's, I can't even count that high. That, that picture, been, they showed it in the video, I mean, it's a really famous picture. You know what the deal was? He just said, I'm not going to meet your quotas. You can't do that to me. I decide. And he took it. Now, that takes courage beyond my ability to comprehend. But, look at that back and that is one brave, tough person, and he still wanted to fight. This would, this many whippings would kill anyone in here today, no doubt. That's what they're checking for here. 
how many how many whip or whip marks you have on your back to see if you're a good worker and obey. That's why that picture is it's actually it's, un, it's an uncomfortable picture. Well, another thing on this was the division of labor. Now, there's going to be a logical division of labor. You know, people having different jobs. But the division of labor was another method of control, a form of racism within the slaves. And the main two occupations, I mean, I know we have all kinds of different things that people can do, but we have the field hands. Discipline's a lot harsher, worse food, miserable conditions, and household help. And the household help, the slaves in the house, a lot of times they call them servants, but they're slaves. You know, they're the ones who prepare the food, clean the clothes, take care of the children. You do all that kind of stuff. Let's say prepare the foods. <laughs> Why am I doing you know, once I started saying children's? Now I'm like doing that, you know, and then there's deers running around. Yes. Um what'd you call people that are field hands? Field Now, which one be treated better? Yeah, and there's a logic to it. They're closer to the family. They know them, or here they're just machines. And and you see that, you know, wage work, you know. It's just, if you don't really know who's working, you don't as much care about it. But also, you know, they're the ones preparing your food. Keep care of the children. You know what does when you to be too harsh, you might do something to the food or your children. But there's something else. They were they had significantly lighter skin than the field hands. I know some of you are thinking, oh, they're on the sun. That's not it. What's that? Yeah, they're the master's children or grandchildren, etc. Yeah, they're related or at least have white ancestry. That's part of the reason why they're field hands. I'm sorry, that's part of the reason why they're household help. I mean, let's be clear about it. Their mothers or grandmothers or whatever were raped by the master. And they're closer. They have more European, uh, they have, or they're more European. Now, so you see the logic to that, but pretty soon it becomes they're treated better. It must be because they have lighter skin. So they're closer to whites. Therefore, they deserve more whites. Now, of course, they were treated just the same as regular slaves, but you can imagine how they felt. We must be better in the field lands. We're closer to them. We're superior because we have lighter skin. So you have this racism within it. So you're going to get situations where field hands might run away to get away from this awful situation, and they'll be ratted on by the fossil tell. They'll tell on. They're the ones who would tell. And this happened all the time. And this is going to linger on long after the Civil War. Where it's going to be people of African descent, but they had lighter skin, would have potentially more opportunities. Felt they were better than, than those who had darker skin. They would do things, and in fact, there's they have a cottage industry. They, they would sell these, they look like torture devices, but they're like irons to straighten their hair. So they look more like whites. Now I know sometimes you know people straighten out their curly, curly hair today, but then it was, I gotta look like a white person. And I gotta look more white so I can be a little bit lighter skinned and not have the same disadvantage as someone with darker skin. This went on for a long time. That's why in the 1960s it was such a big deal when African Americans began to say, no, black is, they literally said black is beautiful, but it's not bad to be black. And they started to let their hair grow out as curly. That they gave a hair, hairstyle would come out of that called Afros, which I know you've all probably heard of, but that was a sign of. Uh, actually, civil rights. And uh, if you have curly hair, then you know, oh, I see you. <laughs> My brother, Zach, completely curly. So he had that too. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's that's where that comes from. I mean, that was a real, actually, that being an attack on, on the hairstyle afro was like, you don't know your place, which is sad and really not that long ago. So, despite, along with the hunger, the beating, and everything else, there were so many fun things about slavery, even though they loved it. The lack of free will. That was the one that slaves, former slaves, in fact, they did a bunch of, they called them slave narratives. 
during the Great Depression as part of, of the New Deal. They went and interviewed. Slaves were not quite old. And they talked about everything, how awful it was. Hunger. Hunger was always one of the biggies. But just that not having control of your own life. Not deciding when you worked, how hard you worked, who you are. And what a big deal. Having no choice in anything. And the best way, what they talked about most, why I put this up here, you could be sold at any time. You have no choice, boom, you're sold. Or your spouse is sold because they needed money. Or, as you see it here, children sold. Sell them cheap. Need money now. Boom, sell a kid. By the way, doesn't that throw that whole civilizing thing out? How can you even fake like you're civilizing when part of the system is selling slaves or spouses away? So that tells you a lot about slavery right here. And this is a slave auction. This is 1823. And this one's from 1789. And it's 16 years. That's 16. <coughs> that's an X. I mean, that's, a, that's an S. Youth. That's an S. Why can't they do S's? And when they did the printing press. It, um, when they made it S like that, really small, it's smudged. But there's an S. There's a bunch of really small S's. I know, but that's why they first started this. These are bigger, but that's when it first came about, because it would smudge with the lower case, and then it became the style. And so you see, they'll write that way. It looks like a cursy bath. And this is something I've wondered about this. A likely healthy young Negro wench. As likely Negroes. My first thought was like, yeah, they're likely, but we're not sure. <laughs> but I'm assuming likely means somebody who is um, almost like likable, but willing to work. Because they're hardworking. I think that's what it means. Other than that, it makes no sense at all. But the idea just means sold out of your family, sold for nothing. I mean, that's just no control of your life at all. Here are a couple of slave markets. That is um, slaves for sale. This is actually from an abolitionist journal, and you see the cat and nine tails. Here is a really weird one because it has the slaves in turbans and clothing when they would be stripped naked. So it almost seems, I mean, it's just a very weird one for the 1850s, but there were slave markets literally across the street. You can go to the spot across the street in the United States Capitol. There's a slave market. They're right there. I mean, it's just, you name it, they're all over. So, that's a slave bar in South Carolina. And this is on the walkie tour. I took a South Car uh, Charleston, great walkie tour. This one talked about some of the names of the slaves. An extra man was a farmhand, and things such as that. Good museum if you get a chance to it. It's, it's, there's a couple of things in there that I'm going to make the hair on the back of my neck stand. And did that tell you the story about the tour guide? And the $5 bills? You don't get it. <laughs> so, the tour guide, actually, you know, very, very genteel, very southern gentleman kind of guy, very friendly, and a good tour guide. He told a good story. We're walking through South, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Does your name wouldn't have been in Charleston? So, yeah, how long ago? Yeah, James is here, so we know. <laughs> oh, really? You were there? It's a cool place. Yeah, when I was here at spring break, too, and if we did it rain, yeah, we, we got dumped on once. But, but we took the tour. Did you have something? I did, yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get there. Sumter's cool. Some of you probably know what Sumter is. When we took this tour, and he's, you know, he's pointing out places. It's very gentle, even though I could tell there was an edge to him. And a couple of times, we finally did say, you know, Northerners just didn't understand our system. The slaves, I mean, we had a system. The slaves, they were treated well. They had good food, good places to live. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think half were like, hmm. Other half were like, you know. But on the tour, we went here. But after walking, he said, you know, there's still a lot of resentment. A lot of resentment against the North. And... You know, when I was a kid, in fact, up to very recently, you didn't pull out a $5 bill. You did not use $5 bills. In fact, you might be thrown out. Why? Lincoln. In fact, there's other places too, but 
from South Carolina. And he said, you know, I don't like five dollar bills to this day. You know, I just that's the way I was brought up. I'm like, God. Of course I did ask, what about pennies? You need know? <laughs> And <laughs> so he read this whole thing. And it was weird because he was a good tour guide. I mean, I'm glad I went because we saw a lot of really interesting stuff. Learned a lot, but at the same time, I had this. I know, I'm weird. I don't like slavery. <laughs> but we got done, and I remember I'm, I'm reaching my pocket. And I'm like, please have my number. Please have my number. To pay him. And so I'm pulling out my money, and my wife whispers to me, Do you have any <laughs> And so, yes, I, had, I think I had. I think I had four or five dollar bills. I can't remember, you know, two or five, twenty dollars a piece or something. But I paid it five dollar bills. And, <laughs> and he just looked at me like <laughs> I know I was a little bratty. I was so glad I did. Alright. <laughs> now <laughs> what about this? <laughs> and the funny thing is, because I asked a lot, I asked, I asked some questions about some things. So I think he, I think at first he really liked me. <laughs> then I'm sure he went back to that. So, okay, dumb Yankee. All right. The slaves fought back vigorously. Like I said, slaves actually don't like slavery. They think slavery is bad. But for lots of reasons, you know, it's really difficult to fight back. So a form of resistance would be passive resistance, where you would delay, don't do things at the right time, hide, act like you're loafing, which, you know, of course, would fit in with, oh, they're just lazy. No, they're not, they don't want to do your work. But what they would do is they would act submissive. And they had two terms for submissive, the whites did. The first one is cuppies. And cuppies would go away after the Civil War. You're actually cupping to cuff somebody is giving the back of their hand. So cupping, a cuppy was somebody who had to beat a little bit to teach them, but now they are disciplined. A cuppy knows their place. They understand that they are inferior to whites. They are submissive. They're the ones who say, yes, sir, no, sir. Don't look them in the eyes. You know, look down, obey. And then as soon as they can, they do something else. And this would be a cuppy. Because she is keeping care of the master's child, but probably finding ways to do little things. Another term that would be used before and then long after the Civil War, well into the 20th century, it means the same thing would be a sample. And a sample would have even more, it would become even more racist, I think, as it survived the war, as basically somebody, uh, uh, somebody who's black, who is, you know, they, they are subservient. They act dumb. They act like um, they don't know what's going on. They play the role that racism puts them. It's a really racist term. And we're going to the 20th century. Now remember, that means subservient. So they're inferior, but they know their place. At least that's how they act. Hey, and hey, you know, you, that's how you act. Then as soon as you can. This is a cartoon from the 1890s to show you how much this term was still being used, and it's awful. So this is him talking. You can't read it. It says, say, Sambo, you think that piece of watermelon is rather large. And then he says, golly, boss, that ain't half big enough. And it has all kinds of racial characteristics in there. This caricature of a black man, you know, it's, they purposely draw ape-like, dark, with big white lips, stupid grin on their face. That was this racist caricature that comes from slavery, that they've accepted this. And this would go on long afterwards. Until the early 1980s, there was a nationwide store or a nationwide restaurant, kind of like a Denny's or IHOP, you know, one of those kind of, you know, cap, you know, like diner places, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And it was called Samples. There's all over Samples here. There's Samples and Villains. I remember going out as a little kid. Samples. And they had these little kind of like cartoonish racist stuff all over the walls. And I remember my parents did not like it at all. Because I mean, my mom and I, but there's like, it was cheap and we didn't have a lot of money. And if we were there building for whatever reason, you know, we would go there. But I remember my mom saying, oh, this is really bad. And it finally went out of business in the early 80s. Now you think about it, 
That's really not that long ago. Now, I know I'm partially saying that because I was alive then. So <laughs> since I was alive, it can't be that long ago. But you know, the kind of almost like comical racism. And speaking of that, since we're talking about these kind of terms, the term that everyone thinks of is from racism, or from slavery too. It is from slavery. And the reason it comes from slavery is, in fact, I'm going to show you something, and it's going to blow you away. This is from 1890, and it's kind of doing the same thing of making fun of this horrific form of racism. And I'll explain why in a second. But it's, it's unbelievable. At the turn of the century, they had these banks. You've probably seen them, the little mechanical banks. I had one that was a puppy dog. And you put, put the coin on its paw, and it would go into its mouth, and the mouth was the bank. Well, that's what this is. It's one of those little mechanical ones. You would buy this, you'd put the coin and throw it in its mouth. And that's what the name of it was. That's by the 1890s, so it's kind of making fun and normalizing. I guess another way to look at it is this horrific form of racism. But let's get to this, what that term meant. The term nigger, what it means is, from slavery, is that is a slave. That is somebody who doesn't know their place. They don't know their place. No, they're inferior, but they're too dumb, too ignorant to know who they're supposed to be. And why that term is racist, I mean, that's just not a name. If somebody uses that term, especially with someone of African descent, what they're saying is, I don't have that name, but I have power over you by giving you that name. By giving you that degrading name, I have power over you. That's why it is such a hated name. It's not just a name, you know, it's not like, you're stupid. No, it's much more than that. And that's why, I mean, some, I think people forgot how it fits directly to slavery. And that was what that somebody who doesn't understand their place and we're gonna beat them until you get it. And if we call you that, be ready to be beaten. And it's power. Racism is power. I have power over you, kind of thing. And so that's why, for very good reason, people of African descent get very upset when whites use that term. And I don't understand, it's a little bit confusing to me why, why people, um, blacks do use that. I understand it's kind of use it and say it doesn't bother us. You can't hurt me with this word. But you, know, you can't hurt me with this, so I'll use it myself. This horrible, really hateful word, but then again, I just think about the legacy of it, and um, it, in a way, it kind of makes me sad that they do that. But isn't that awful? I can remember stuff like this going into a toy store in Omaha, Nebraska, in the early 1970s, and something like this was there without it. That's 1970s. You know, the Civil Rights Act though, was just passed in '64. All right. So, the most common form of passive resistance would be sabotage, break stuff. Does that make sense? Think about a cotton plantation. Look at all these implements and everything you can break or lose. Make mistakes on. Gum up the work. Jam something into the cotton gin so it doesn't work anymore. Break your hoe. Break your shovel. Dump all the seeds in one hole. I didn't know you weren't supposed to dump all the seeds in the creek. Nobody told me that. And then act stupid. Because slaves are supposed to be stupid. I did not know that you're supposed to, you're not supposed to harness the horse in a way that doesn't choke them. You didn't tell me that. Why do they do that? They get choked, they don't pull. See? If you, but if you, you gotta use the right, proper way to use the harness. I know it's a big round around your neck, but if you don't do it right, little things like that. I had no idea that you weren't supposed to pee in the soup. <laughs> Nobody told me that. You think I'm kidding about that? No. no. <laughs> I had no idea. No. So I actually do know that. You shouldn't do that. See, I've got to be a thing where as soon as you cook your meal, that night you'd be sick. I got a stomach ache. Am I catching the flu? Or... <laughs> I mean, really, it, you're not sure, right? Well, that's why it that. That's why slaves don't work in factories. Think about factories with all the moving parts. Think about how easy it would be to break stuff. That's why you don't see a lot of slave labor. Nazi Germany tried millions of slaves. 
They captured people from all over Europe and forced them to go to Germany to work as slave labor into their, in their factories. And German munitions were infamous. The shells would blow up in the barrels, tanks would break down, things wouldn't work, fire plants wouldn't work. Why? Slave labor fought back. They helped win the war, no doubt about it. They're risking their lives. I mean, that took a lot of courage. The big one, like German tanks, you have to put ball bearings and wheels or you can squeeze like that over there. <laughs> well, they wouldn't take. They wouldn't have the ball bearings. You have metal running against metal, and just grind the tracks up. It takes a lot of guts. That's why one of the reasons why there wouldn't be industry in the south. Okay, next big way. Ran away. Run away. But run away. Where are you going to go? And look how hundred dollars back at the turn of the century, twelve hundred by eighteen fifty three. Slaves began to run away. That was a lot of money going to be big business. You have these uh, bounty hunters would go pick up runaway slaves. There are these slave hunting, basically um, like posses go through the South looking for runaway slaves. And oh, what does a runaway slave look like? You're black, you're a runaway slave. So a lot, a lot of free people would be kidnapped. It's in the slave. Anyone see the movie 12 Years a Slave? Only one? Two? It's only a couple years ago. It was rated R. And that was the story of a guy who was kidnapped and sent down to slavery. And it's very brutal, and it was probably only about half as brutal as it really was. I might, I'm, I give you some extra credit movies to watch. Maybe I'll put that on there, but it is rated R, so you have to get parental approval. <laughs> 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 There's a scene there where it looks like they actually whipped the guy. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. And remember, it was probably much worse than that. That's what gets me. And people were saying, oh, it wasn't that violent, especially, you know, slavery wasn't that bad. Okay, so they ran away. We've all heard of. The Underground Railroad would be this very informal group of like safe houses and places where slaves could hide. The biggest one would be like along the river or the coastline, where places they could hide, then they know certain steamboats they could smuggle along. That would be the most common way to get from down river here, or go to Mexico or down this way. And you know, these were places they could hide, and there be, might be some people to guide them, but more anything else is just you know go to this. Place and find the next safe house. Yeah. So, underground, underground railroad. Underground uh, <laughs> railroad. Um, that's just like places for them to like hide out. Mm -hmm. To try to escape. Okay. Usually go north or you know just get any place where there's not slavery. And then you have to, this was very hostile this area here to runaway slaves. So they had to get out of here too, and get up to Canada or at least maybe safe here. Even though slave hunters would come up there and capture even here. That's under the Constitution, return runaway slaves. And this is one of the more famous ones. A guy sent himself in a box. So that became kind of infamous amongst abolitionist circles. And he had these slave hunters that would go through and run runaway slaves down with dogs and stuff like just lynch them right there. So you're taking your life in your own hand. And those who helped, if they're usually they were former slaves or slaves, they would they'd be beaten or perhaps even killed, and white people might be lynched too. And did anyone learn about this in elementary school? I think it was like an underground railroad. Like a real underground railroad. I got them in I, like second grade. I was just envisioning like these tunnels. And I, and I remember asking my older brother, how do they have time to build tunnels? And he's like, shh. Because that's what older brothers do. You dummy. They flew. <laughs> and one place I'll tell you, one of the most famous way stations would a church. Churches would be a great place. Because blacks would have their own churches. So this is in Savannah, Georgia. Have you went to the Savannah? You have? Yeah. When were you in Savannah? Where I was really young. Oh, so you don't really... It's one of my favorite towns in, in America. It's one of the coolest places I've ever been in my life. And I'm really not... Besides maybe like Circle or Jordan, Montana. Then maybe. Right? Yeah, you know Jordan. It's just a, an amazingly cool town. But this was built by slaves. So you think about it. They're in a plantation... They're working, you know, filling out that quota, working, you know, as hard as you can imagine. 
Then at night, they would come in and they built this. This is the tower they had in the 1920s. And you can probably guess what happened to it. That's what it looks like a couple years ago. It finally just went down, which is too bad. But the church is really, it's really cool. And they give tours through it. That's part of the way they pay for the church. But this was just a black church. But you think about it, slaves went there. And so that was a place they could gather. And on the floor, they had all these holes drilled in. They put little designs all over. Why? They're air holes. It was a false floor. And there was a little, about three and a half foot little area that the slaves could hide. And then what they would do is they would crawl on, he said, our guide said it was less than three by three, most of it, so three, three feet. So a little tunnel that went about a mile to the Savannah River where they could smuggle on board ship. So they would hide in there until the ship came. I always think about how terrifying that would be to go through it. Think about a tunnel that big, pitch black, for a mile crawling. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone claustrophobic? You will be after that. <laughs> it's really great. If you ever get a chance to go to Savannah, go. It's, it's, it's one of the neatest places I've been. That was really cool. Two of the most famous conductors on the Underground Railroad were Sojourner Truth, pretty amazing person. Sojourner Truth life is just unreal. But both were runaway slaves, and the most famous is Harriet Tubman. And Harriet Tubman would lead hundreds, if not thousands, of people. North, she was a runaway slave, and both incredibly brave, and they took advantage of the fact that, especially here at Tubman, small, and women, and people would discount them, and that's foolish. They were just, they were more brave than anybody else, leading people across, and risking their life, because she would have been caught. By, um, by 1860, she was wanted, and they would have. And, yeah, so one of the more famous ones, she would, or she's going to be on the, well, last last year, she she's, she's going to be on the front of the $20 bill in about 10 years. And Jackson's going to be on the back now. And I don't know if that's going to stay. That was an executive order. And because he needs bureau of gravy, that's through the president. And so that could be reversed back again. But and I, if, I, I, if I was gambling, I'd say I would not be surprised if it's reversed, but she certainly, I would argue, deserves to be on there. This is a picture of it. The only problem I have with this picture is, and it's pretty close to the truth. And by the way, then she looks very small and unassuming until you look at her and think, that's a determined human. <laughs> She's probably not that tall. Other than that, that's a pretty cool picture. And the Underground Railroad would take people north. There would be some slave rebellions, but very few. Remember all those numbers I showed you with the percentages? They're just simply not that many. Or there's, there's too many whites to have a slave rebellion. There's going to be some massive ones in the Caribbean and Brazil. In fact, there's going to be like a, a slave kingdom they carved out the jungle right there. So there's going to be a few slave rebellions, though, that did happen in the United States. And New Orleans in 1811. That's probably the biggest slave rebellion. And it was brutally put down. Over 200 slaves would be butchered after this, executed, and their heads put on pikes along the path that the rebellion went. If you go there today, one of the, I think it's very fitting, but it's, a, it's if you're not ready for it, so think of, you know, heads on pikes, that's the memorial. And I think, yeah, that's what they did. As a warning to every other slave. And so that's the memorial. No, that's not real hands, but that's 1811 in New Orleans. 1822 was Charleston, South Carolina. Denmark Bessie was a freedman, and he was accused of starting or going to start a slave rebellion. We don't know exactly what was going to happen, but anybody want to guess who told on him? Yeah, exactly. Actually, it was the household slave of the governor. And so that's Denmark Vesey. And the point is, remember how scared they were? It didn't happen all the time, but there was just enough. But the one that would change the South forever. In fact, there's a movie about it right now. Taking the title, The Birth of a Nation. Nat Turner's Rebellion in Virginia, 1831. Nat Turner was a slave. 
He was also a minister. He knew how to read, know how to read and write. A lot of slaves wanted to read and write because you can use them for various work. He convinced people on this plantation, we have no choice. We're going to have to rise up, and they will beat us to death, so we're going to have to kill them, and then go from plantation to plantation, get more slaves, and then basically his plan was kind of go into the mountains. Just Well, this is from the Richmond Whig showing them they massacred everybody in the home. All the whites there, they're mastering everybody else, and it shows that it's a terrible massacre. But the militia came. Why? The second house, if everyone one guess who told on them, one of the household slaves. Nat Turner's going to be, well, actually 200 blacks would be killed. He would be captured, wounded, but captured. And he'd be put on trial, which is kind of weird the way they did things, and would be executed for this. But Nat Turner's rebellion terrified the son. Terrifying. I got a little bit of this to finish tomorrow. Then we'll go to the fiery 50s. Have a great day, everybody.